Chang and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, Apple dives deeper into AR and could have a headset in stores by 2019. How the new device will stack up against the competition. Plus, Snap is getting a helping hand from China's Tencent. After a disappointing earnings report, the Chinese tech giant is buying a large stake. Is it enough to help boost Snap's disappearing returns? And a new era for the Xbox. Details on the new console and why Microsoft is boosting its video game investments. First, to our lead at a Bloomberg scoop. Apple is said to be developing an augmented reality headset that could be in stores by 2019. A couple of things will set this apart from existing available AR devices. One, it will contain its own display, so you won't have to insert your smartphone into the rig. It'll also have its own dedicated operating system. I sat down with Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who broke this story. I think we have an in-depth look at a bunch of different projects they're working on. At Apple, there's this team codenamed T288. They're working on two headsets. They're working on new software features for your AR, AR kit on the iPhone. And the first headset they're working on is the big one, the one you were talking about. It's a standalone headset that runs its own operating system and doesn't need to have an iPhone attached to it. But they're also working on a more interim, near-term headset that's sort of like an Oculus Gear VR, where you actually put the phone into it and strap it on your head. They don't actually plan to sell this. This is something that they're doing for testing, mm. leveraging the AR functionality that's already baked into the iPhone. And it very much seems they're focusing on AR versus VR, right? Yeah, that's right. Tim Cook has been very clear about how Apple thinks that AR is the more mainstream feature, and I tend to agree. VR has great applications for gaming or education environments, but AR is something like a watch or a phone that you can use in your day-to-day -day life. Apple wants to make things that they can get people to line up for. A gaming headset, the market is much more niche, whereas an AR headset has several different applications. I spoke with Tim Cook earlier this year. I asked him about AR and how Apple is thinking about it. Take a listen to what he had to say. With a core technology uh, and as a platform owner, the, the first thing, and uh, arguably in some ways the most important, is to build the foundation. And then from that foundation, you can do many things off of it, but first you have to have a really solid foundation. And so uh, I think the developers are really gonna love what they find in the, in the developer build on ARKit. So he's talking about AR kit there for developers. Talk to us how you see, based on that and what you know now, how Apple is sort of differentiating or marking its territory, let's say, in the AR VR space. So AR kit is very important. And like you said, they are marking their territory because they're creating an ecosystem of developers who will begin to create AR apps looking toward this headset, you know, two or three years from now. They're also putting themselves out there and saying, hey, we're an AR company. We're doing this. This is a big focus for us. And they're not just talking anymore. There was about a six month, eight month period of time where Apple was talking up to AR, Tim Cook specifically, you know, bragging about it, talking about how it's the next big thing. But to see how quickly they begin to actually back that up and show their cards with ARKit is a, is a big step for the company. And what sort of applications do you imagine, real world applications? So for this headset, they're developing a new operating system, which is extraordinarily significant because that means that they're all in on this. Mm -hmm. An OS called ROS, which is similar to iOS on the phone or watchOS on the Apple Watch. And this is going to have all sorts of applications. It's going to be an iPhoneized version of AR. It's called Reality Operating System. Things like maps, text messages, virtual meeting rooms with avatars, watching 360 degree video with the video projected into your eyes, all sorts of stuff that you can imagine on a headset. So you got another scoop uh, also on the iPad. You know, That's we right. saw strong numbers on the iPad when Apple reported earnings, which, you know, in some ways is, is surprising because there has been concern that, you know, the iPad was on its way out, but clearly not if you look at the sales. And now you, they're working on a new one. Right. So what they did starting at the end of 2015 is they sort of moved the iPad from the iPad to an iPad Pro, sort of positioning it as a little bit more of a computer 
replacement, something with a keyboard. And they got rid of the Mini. They, they still sell the Mini, but they haven't updated it, mm. and it's very unlikely they're going to update it again due to the cannibalization by the, the bigger iPhones and on the iPhone 10. But anyways, back to the iPad. They moved toward this iPad Pro structure, and a lot of people have been liking the keyboards and the Apple Pencil stylus, so they're going all in on that, on that Pro approach. So now at the low end, they have a $330 regular iPad with that 10-inch screen. Now they have the iPad Pros. They updated those in June in the 10.5-inch model, which I use as well. I think it's great, and it's become extraordinarily popular. Nobody can say enough good things about that one. So again, we're seeing a family of devices just like we're seeing with the phone, you know, in a range of price rates. How do you see the, 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 the cannibalization evolving? Like, what gets cannibalized? And what... <laughs> you know, becomes the big category. You know, we or do they all? Right, I mean, we thought it had to be something, right? Mm -hmm. We thought the iPad was gonna cannibalize the Mac as Mac sales started to slow down a couple of mm -hmm. years ago. And then what started to happen in 2015 is iPad sales started to slow down and Mac sales both would shoot up. So we're like, oh, is the Mac back and cannibalizing the iPad? But here we are in their Q4 earnings from a week ago, and they presented higher numbers, strong, very strong, actually, year-over-year -year unit and revenue growth in both the Mac and iPad categories. So it's basically the opposite of what everyone was expecting. Mm -hmm. There's no cannibalization going on either end. Will it happen eventually? It will have to, but I think it's going to be a while. That was Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Gurman. Meantime, Apple sold $7 billion of bonds, even as proposed new tax laws may leave it a wash in cash it previously couldn't use. As of the end of September, Apple was sitting on nearly $270 billion in cash and marketable securities, 94% of which was outside the United States. The company is selling bonds to fund its share repurchases and dividends. Coming up, a surprise for Snap investors as China's Tencent buys a 10% stake. What does Tencent see in the company? And can the move give some life to the struggling startup after such a tough quarter? And later, Postmates steps up its delivery game, the startup expanding further into food and groceries to go head-to-head -head with Amazon. CEO Bastian Lehman joins us to discuss the move. This is Bloomberg. It's been a wild week for Snap. The company reported disappointing earnings results, setting the stock dramatically lower. Then Chinese tech giant Tencent swooped in to buy a 12% stake in the company. I caught up with Sarah Fryer, who covers Snap for Bloomberg Technology, to talk about the details of the deal and Snap's strategy to combat slowing user growth. So this is a great time to be buying up Snap stock as it's really declined since the IPO. For Tencent, this deal is is uh, not hostile, according to our sources, but strategic. And they will be giving input on Snap's direction, which, which I think is very interesting because, you know, Evan Spiegel, the leader of Snapchat, is very set in his vision for the company. And what we saw yesterday with the earnings is that he's been willing to evolve that vision and actually said that he would redesign the app to make it more appealing to a broad audience. Earnings yesterday, not good. We actually have a, a chart here, G hashtag BTV5317, showing what happened. The stock dropped after hours, spiked back up after this 10 cent deal news. You know, what can we expect going forward? Well, Tencent just had a habit of buying up stakes in companies and then eventually taking them over. Uh, does not look like that is what's happening here, at least at the outset. It makes more sense to see whether Snap can go it on its own and, and really build this advertising business. And what we saw in the last quarter is that they're really at the beginning of this self-serve advertising and that they need some time to prove to advertisers that they can get a return on investment before that becomes a bigger business for them. Tencent, so. of course, is also the owner of WeChat. Do we expect Tencent to have an input here in product decisions, in strategy decisions, given this size of their stake? I think they'll have some voice in strategy, absolutely. And, and the other thing to look at here is Evan has always had an admiration for WeChat and Tencent and how they've built it. Uh, he He's you know spoken about that in his public appearances. This is something that he has some reverence for. Unlike, you know, he's made some veiled comments against Facebook and mm -hmm. how they've built their app. I think he does see Snap as more of a messaging platform than a social network. Bloomberg Technologies, Sarah Fryer there. 
Meantime, lawmakers are still hammering out final details on tax reform. Any changes to the corporate tax rate could have huge implications for tech firms. I caught up with Steve Ballmer, owner of the LA Clippers, co-founder of the Ballmer Group and former Microsoft CEO, to talk about what we know so far about the GOP tax overhaul plan. A couple things. Uh, number one, uh, what we're trying to do is make sure at USA Facts that people can take a look at the plan in the context of history. That's important. Number two, you've got to ask what are the goals of this plan? Because we want to be able, through the data, to hold government accountable for achieving the goals. Is the goal to improve standard of living, and if so, from whom? Is the goal to redistribute money, if so? Is the goal to make businesses more effective? Is the goal to borrow from our future? Uh, in my own case, I'm partisan on a couple issues. Number one, I do believe uh, in, uh, in balancing the budget. Uh, will we achieve that, or will we not? Uh, will jobs grow or not to, uh, to support that? open question that will need to be assessed over time. Uh, and I care a lot about opportunities for kids that are born in tough situations. Uh, and I got to say, uh, you know, I wish there was a little more in the plan uh, from a tax perspective to support those low-income kids. Uh, let's talk about Microsoft. You're one of Microsoft's largest shareholders. I mean, would you like to see a provision, for example, whereby companies, uh, when they repatriate cash, they have to invest in jobs. They have to hire more people in the United States or, let's say, invest 10 percent in R&D? Well, I think that simplifying the uh, tax code on companies with foreign earnings is important. I think letting U.S. companies be competitive internationally, now I'm speaking as a former CEO as opposed to head of USA Fact, I think those things are important. Society does have to decide whether those things are going to uh, accrue to the benefit of people who own shares or whether somehow people who own shares are going to wind up redistributing some of that uh, tax gain to other people uh, in society, either through the kinds of uh, requirements that you talked about for reinvestment uh, in R&D and new jobs, or simply by, in other forms, increasing the taxes on shareholders as opposed to uh, the taxes on corporations to, to be revenue and income neutral so that shareholders don't necessarily see a windfall. Microsoft has a huge operation in Puerto Rico. The House bill would put a 20 percent tax on offshore affiliates, including Puerto Rico, even though it's part of the United States. This would significantly change Microsoft's tax bill. It wouldn't be good for Apple either. How concerned are you about this? Well, I'm not concerned about it at all. I think in the long run, uh, this notion of becoming more competitive and more consistent with global tax standards uh, will be a very good thing. Uh, companies like Microsoft and Apple do owe it to their shareholders to do the best job that they can uh, to optimize taxes in the context of the tax code. Uh, these companies, including my, uh, my former company, Microsoft, have done that. Uh, I think just my quick read is there's not likely to be much difference uh, in terms of profits that flow are available for the shareholders of these big companies. We've seen big tech companies, Facebook, Twitter, Google, testifying before Congress. When you and I last spoke a few weeks ago, you suggested that there's not a lot more these companies can do when it comes to uh, fake news and such. Are you more or less concerned after hearing the testimony, uh, given that a lot of these companies were unprepared for the questions? Well, let me, let me, let me correct you a little bit. I said these companies will never be able to get to ground zero and eliminate this notion of fake news. Can they do better? Of course they can always do better. But it's a st statistical game. How much of these, this uh, you know, sort of alternate fact, fake news thing can they screen? Uh, the thing that you know, I would say uh, is worth pushing from a government perspective is this notion of being better and having a way to characterize what it means to be better and a set of standards to which the companies can be held. I think that's very hard to do. Uh, the bully pulpit of government may be the best way to get there, and certainly the hearings you talked about really put companies on the hot seat in terms of what they're going to do to ensure integrity in what people consume on their sites. But at the end of the day, they're open. People can say what they want to say. 
uh, random American citizens, in addition to, uh, you know, sort of bad actors from outside the United States. That was some of my conversation earlier with former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. Coming up, our interview with outgoing Cisco Executive Chairman John Chambers. He spent billions of Cisco's money on startups over the years. Now he's applying those lessons to his own startups. And Uber is teaming up with NASA. That's right, NASA, to get its flying car tech off the ground. Details next. This is Bloomberg. Cisco has always been involved in startups. Under CEO John Chambers, the company acquired dozens of firms, spending billions of dollars and seeing sales grow from a billion to more than $40 billion over his 24 years at the helm. Our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, spoke with Chambers at the Techonomy Conference in Half Moon Bay, California, and asked about whether the U.S. government gets it when it comes to startups. I think only halfway. Corey, I think we're viewing this as transactions, not part of a bigger picture. Uh, the U.S. has traditionally led in startups. Today, we are not at all. Uh, in the first uh, five years of this decade, we only grew our startup community by 12 percent over five years. Our peers like Australia, France, India grew by 40 to 60 percent. The Chinese grew by 100 percent. The Chinese do 4,000 startups per day. We are not entitled. We have to disrupt or get disrupted. It. You're now seeing countries such as France, which was the last place you and I would have done business uh, three or four years ago, become the startup nation of Europe. Uh, you watch President Hollande and now President Macron lead in changing their country. But they don't do it by transactions. They do it by combining the whole picture together. GDP growth, startups, that's where all job creation will occur. How does that tie into your tax plan? How does that tie into your education system? How does that tie into your security? The U.S. is the only country in the world that does not have a national digital policy, of which startups is the number one job creation engine everywhere in the world. So we're behind, and while tax policy change is important and creating the right environment for uh, startups is important, we are lagging the rest of the world in the area that we must lead. So I think these were a good first step, but they're a step that we should have done 5, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we need to think about where we want to paint a picture of optimism for our country, how startups will be the job creation engine with large companies, Corey, not creating any incremental jobs in this next decade. 40% of them will go away. There'll be huge productivity there. If we're going to get 25 to 30 million jobs, it's got to be through a startup community, and it can't be at the anemic rate we are now. We are in last place, and we don't have a cohesive plan to tie it all together. Uh, we have even, elements in John, silos, even as, such as tax policy, et cetera. Well, yeah, but even as Silicon Valley seems to be the envy of the world, I mean, mm -hmm. everywhere I go, everyone I talk to says, you know, we're creating the Silicon Valley of the sand, or the Silicon Valley of the ocean, or the Silicon Valley of Boston, or the Silicon Valley of Israel, or, you know, it seems that Silicon Valley is still held up as a model. What is missing there? What needs to happen? Well, you said it very well. We talked about Silicon Valley as being the example for the rest of the world, and then you paralleled Boston 128, which used to be the example two decades ago. You, If you don't make it disrupt, if you don't, you know, you've got to disrupt as opposed to be disrupted. It's got to be across all 50 states, not just in Silicon Valley. I'd argue Silicon Valley is a little bit out of touch with the rest of America about how we create jobs in throughout the central part of the nation and the southeast part of the nation. And as I go around the world, let's use India as an example, Modi is looking at creating Silicon Valleys in all 29 of his states in India for 1.3 billion people. He's talking about GDP growth not at 3 or 4 or 5 percent and being excited. He's talking about 7 to 10 percent. Uh, J.P. Morgan just came out the other day saying they predicted India would grow at 10 percent per year. India is growing because of Modi's digital agenda because of job creation inclusiveness across the board. That's what you see in France. The last place you would have done business three years ago and we said it become the startup nation of Europe. They set a pace to do this across the entire country. We need to do it in every street and every city in our country and we do not have a plan to do that. And then we got to bring education with us so the young people can participate in this future. Is there something that could be done with tax or with, with cash repatriation that would encourage startups? Because last time we had a 
big cash repatriation for companies. We saw that went into buybacks and dividends. Didn't necessarily go into hiring. It didn't go into R&D. It just went into the shareholders' pockets, which, you know, it's their company. I, I'm not necessarily against that. But if the goal is to encourage startups, and if the goal is to encourage business investment, what, uh, what necessary uh, policy do you think needs to be attached to any repatriation uh, um, taxation policy? We have to think of how we solve a problem, not with a single silo or questions. We have to tie them together. So we need a much more competitive tax system. Dropping the corporate tax rate for startups at 20% is a great start. We've got to then combine with when you repatriate money, is this going to create an opportunity for startups? The answer is absolutely yes, because there'll be a number of startups bought and create a market where startups see an exit pa uh, pattern as well. But the major thing we can't fall into the trap of doing, there is no golden single solution. You've got to say, how do you combine this in a policy that combines startup engines with tax policy, with education, uh, thinking about how do we literally have a national startup mentality, and how do we capture the imagination of the Democrats and Republicans, not to argue about tax policy, which Corey, you and I have been talking about for 15 years, but talk about the future in terms of the opportunity, inspiring hope that, again, Americans' children will have a better life than their parents. Right now, throughout the central part of the nation, the southeast, they don't believe that. And changing our education system. France is changing their whole education system around startups and digitization, partnering with Cisco. They will do it first with pilots, then they'll do it across the whole country. Why isn't the U.S. talking about changing an education system that is broke and doing it at speed? Key takeaway here, it's about innovation with speed. We're moving too slow. We don't have a national policy. This should be something the Democrats and Republicans are all over. Tax policy and repatriation is just one element of the equation. You need to say, how do we change the future? Talk to me about what you're doing in the world of startups. I have a lot of limitations, but I'm usually pretty good on the market transitions from the role the internet played in our future uh, to voice becoming free to global digitization. Uh, and you think about startups, the big picture is very simple. Uh, that's where all the job creation will come. I'm going to invest in 10 to 12 startups. Uh, it's going to be spread pretty evenly throughout the United States, and we can talk about that later and around the world. Uh, they will vary from a, a drone startup uh, to a defensive drone startup to transparency in open government, uh, to social media and how that will change the customer experience, to security around phones, to company like Pindrop that you and I talked about in February of this year, moving from literally fraud detection to voice authentication, all the way to our next source of protein, which will be uh, from crickets and from insects. Well, you will consume the majority of your protein 15 to 20 years from now on uh, animals from areas like crickets. Well, I want to break these ideas down. So Let's start with that cricket idea. So uh, I want to know what the company is, but I, I think the problem is so interesting because as you mentioned, you know, protein is so expensive, the most expensive part of every meal around the world. It's also the, the, the most uh, time consuming thing to create. It takes three years to raise a cow, for example, before it can be uh, used in the food chain, but also uh, has a, a big impact on the environment. Talk to me about this cricket investment. Basically, when I ran into the individual, Mohammed Ashur from Aspire Company uh, at the Clinton Global Initiative, the last thing I was going to do was invest in the next generation of food supply. I thought that had nothing to do with technology, yet it has everything. Basically, crickets can be the most safe form of protein raised at 1% of the space. We're running out of space to have the amount of uh, meat proteins and agricultural proteins generated. It does one-seventh the environmental impact and at a dramatically lower cost. So you combine all this together that the best way you can serve the environment isn't how what car you drive or your home, it's the protein you put on your plate. Crickets will be a staple, in my opinion, and I'm pretty good with the market transitions, uh, 15, to 20 per, 15 to 20 years from now are the majority of the protein that you consume. So it's a leap of faith, but it really talks about getting the transition with the Internet of Things, robotic, robotic cricket farming, capturing the cloud data capability to grow these faster and safer than we've ever done before. That was outgoing Cisco Chairman John Chambers speaking with Bloomberg's Corey Johnson. Coming up, Microsoft is out with a new console and plans on boosting its video game investments. We'll bring you all the details next. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back.
back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Microsoft has long been a dominant software company, but one of its greatest success stories in hardware is the Xbox. The latest console, the Xbox One X, was made available to the public earlier this week. Amidst the release, Microsoft plans to increase investments in developing in-house video games, including starting or acquiring studios to do so. Bloomberg's editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, spoke with Phil Spencer, Microsoft's head of gaming, for more details. Gaming's a huge business, $100 billion business uh, globally, growing double digit. Microsoft has some unique assets with Xbox Live and Azure, Minecraft, the products that we build, and working with Satya Nadella and Amy Hood, the CFO, this is a category we want to be in and we want to invest in. Minecraft, Minecraft is an acquisition. I have to ask about this acquisition. I do want to get to the hardware, <laughs> but my daughters are obsessed with Microsoft's Minecraft, and they're obsessed with Microsoft Minecraft on the Xbox, but on their phones, yeah. wherever they are, they take the games everywhere. It seems to me like that's a vision of a modern success where a game came out of nowhere like a Tetris or something it's got it got to be successful because the gameplay was great and a really you know not pretty but wonderful in modern Legos or something when well, you, you hit on a really important part that now players are playing the games across every device right that's you know, the thing that's amazing about it and we're connecting those players across all of those devices so your your family can play Minecraft somebody can be on Nintendo switch playing with somebody on an iPhone they didn't buy a device from us but they're using Xbox Xbox Live, they're using Minecraft, they're playing together in the same worlds. Obviously for us, the console's an important part there, which is why we invest in Xbox and Xbox One X, but connecting to gamers wherever they are is the vision of Microsoft around what we're doing in gaming. So, which brings us back to the launch of the device. So That's right. why launch and why spend uh, presumably hundreds of millions, if not more, developing a new Xbox console? Because you want to reach gamers on every screen, and a television screen is an incredibly important place where people play. Xbox One X is the, the most important? No. One, like the customer is the most important. None of the devices are the most important. It's the customer experience. They move from device to device. We have with Xbox a unique capability on television. Xbox One X, 4K console, most powerful console out there. Xbox One S, a great value in gaming. Both of them play all the same games, so you're able to play those games on your television. But when somebody goes onto a phone and wants to stay connected to their friends, they go to the PC, want to stay connected with their friends, we can bring those services to the gamers. How important is market, market share versus versus Nintendo and versus uh, Sony's PlayStation? The two metrics I really look at in the growth of this business is engagement of players. How many monthly active players do you have across any device? And what does your software and service revenue look like for those players? Because obviously we're in business and we're trying to monetize. Well then why don't you give the boxes away? We, you know, boxes aren't the bar big part of the business, right. right? The margin on the box is minimal. We subsidize the boxes to get them out there in a lot of cases. But if someone owns a phone and doesn't want to go buy a console, we still want to be, them to be able to play our games, bring the services like our video distribution through Mixer, Xbox Live, Minecraft, as we talked about, bring it whatever device they have. We think on the television, there's a unique capability to play. It's a great communal atmosphere, people sitting on a couch with controllers playing. We think that's an important part of the gaming ecosystem, but there's a billion gamers on the planet. They play on all kinds of devices. Um, it seems also the Xbox Live uh, and the, the like have been really important to your success. Yeah. But I still know about kids who are, who've got their cell phones out and have got speaker phones out instead of using Live. Uh, what, what does that say about the way the games are played and the way the games are designed? Well, just because they have their phone out doesn't mean they're not on Xbox Live. Xbox Live is on Android. It's on iOS. We right. see millions of customers on those devices that we never see on any other device. So you really want to meet the customer and the device with the right scenario, whether it's voice, whether it's text, whether it's watching gameplay or playing games. You want to meet them on every device and make sure you have the right services and like you hit it. Make sure you focus on the customer, the device they want to use for the purpose they want to use it. What is the range of development costs for a serious console game right now? Oh, it's but from a million dollars for your, you know, now what you a million, see. Microsoft no, no, is no. not doing a million dollar game. No, you talk about though the ecosystem. Okay. You have people who are starting games now with an idea. And right. the nice thing about these games today is you can actually put an idea out there and grow with the community. We have the game preview program, which allows people to ship unfinished games, get feedback from the community and grow those games. One of our biggest hits is coming on December 12th is Player Unknown Battlegrounds, one of the biggest, hottest games on PC out there today. But it ships 
early and it still hasn't hit 1.0. It's in kind of a pre-beta phase. Right. They have 18 million players already playing this game and they haven't hit 1.0 yet. Oh, we're looking at Forza right now. Yeah, yeah, Forza is a good I'm game. not a big game gamer. I love me some Forza. <laughs> in the other end of the extreme, there are very expensive games with the highest production value rivaling what you see in television today in high quality television or movies. I mean, it is it is a true so art the, form. What's the top of the line development cost for the biggest games and consoles? I'm not asking, oh, you can you easily build, build a game for over $100 million, easily. Uh, but that's long that. been true. That's been, that dollar amount's been out there. Has, has there, have we no, seen there's no, a, there's no like asymptotic growth in the development cost of games, but I will say, in a way, once your game starts growing and people are playing and you have games like a Minecraft or like a GTA that have been now played for years, you want to continue to feed that ecosystem, give them more content. Players stay engaged with games for an awful long time. And if you can continue to give them content and they have a great experience, that's awesome as a business. Now, I don't want to downplay this, this release of the, this hardware device, but uh, it is Good. iterative. Yes. Uh, compared to some other major devices that have taken so long. Just really quickly, do you think we're going to see more iterative releases in this industry going forward, or we're just at a special time right now, kind of in between consoles, when the market's really big and, and ready for this kind of thing? Uh, the customer will tell us. Like, just being honest, like we're we're trying something this time with Xbox One X. It's compatible with everything you've ever purchased on Xbox right. One. It plays all the same games, but gives you a capability on a 4K television that no other console can give you. I'm curious to see how people react to it. If they react to it well, we'll continue to try to create state-of-the-art hardware for people to play on their television. Well, Uber has teamed up with NASA to bring its flying taxi service, Uber Air, one step closer to takeoff. The partnership will focus on new technology to manage air traffic and give Uber a bridge to regulators. Uber's chief product officer Jeff Holden spoke exclusively to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow at the Web Summit in Lisbon. He says collaborating with NASA will boost Uber Air's speed to market. NASA is the inventor of uh, new airspace management technology. It's a framework, essentially, or standard um, called UTM, which is Unmanned Aerial Systems Traffic Management. Um, and the reason this is important is because with uh, Uber Air, we're going to be having a lot of aircraft flying over cities, an unprecedented number of aircraft flying over cities. Um, and in order to manage that air traffic in a way that's um, efficient and safe, um, we just need new technology. The UTM, we believe, is the answer to that. Um, and, that and there's a lot of people who believe that. That's a, it's it's pretty widely accepted at this point. The Space Act represents a formal collaboration agreement between Uber and NASA. Um, and many people forget that NASA is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. They actually you know, uh, focus a ton of their energy on aviation. Um, and, uh, and so the, since they're the developer of this technology and they, play, they are very connected in, uh, and you know, engaged with regulatory bodies around it as well, this collaboration makes a ton of sense in order to um, you know, bring this to market as fast as possible. And it's a part of making this Uber Air vision a reality. That's exciting. Yes. And NASA is, is a big partner. Yeah. But the cynic would say, this is pie in the sky thinking. Mm. What is NASA's involvement mean for the reality of Uber Air actually happening? Oh, well, so the way we're approaching it is um, we, we are not boiling the ocean and trying to change all the airspace technology at the same time. Um, you know, uh, NASA's developing the framework, and they have a whole kind of model for testing it under different conditions, these the technical capability level approaches. And we're engaging with them in the last stage of that called technical capability level four. Um, this is about working in, in sort of uh, you know, dense urban environments. And so we're already very advanced and far along with their process. But we are actually, Uber is developing the technology to implement this. So we will actually be building the actual technology that the aircraft will talk to in actually managing and navigating airspace. And we're also trying not to boil the ocean, as I mentioned, uh, and change this all at once, but instead work next to existing air traffic control systems and implement UTM on just areas like corridors through classically controlled air traffic, uh, airspace. And so this approach is kind of like, you know, uh, sort of you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run, in co combination with us building the technology and NASA bringing their expertise on airspace and simulation environments and that type of thing is a perfect gathering of, of kind of the forces and, and skills to make this happen as fast as possible. One big question for VTOL is batteries, right? And when you're developing the craft itself, mm -hmm. there's an issue over size and weight. Yes. Have you thought about that? What is the next step for Uber in looking at battery research? Is that another thing that you could be moving into to speed up the wider project? Yeah, well, battery research is something we're looking at very closely right now. We may have some announcements on this in the future, um, and, uh, but you can assume that we're going to be digging into that deeply. Um, the battery technology of today will actually let us do, if we were to take literally the lithium ion batteries of today and package them up the right way for an Elevate vehicle, for an Uber Air vehicle, um, we could actually fly a subset of our missions. So on the order of kind of 25 miles, not 60 miles, we have a 60 mile target 
target for our for our launch in 2023. Um, again, we're launching demonstrators in 2020, but by 2023, we want to be doing our full missions. And um, and so that there's some advancement that needs to happen on the battery, but we think it's actually very realistic. But it does require real work, and it requires not just doing the work on the actual underlying technology, but also mass manufacturing of those batteries. So we have to solve both of those problems, and Uber will play a role in that. Regulation. Yeah. How difficult is that going to be? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's appropriately difficult. Um, it's not. You know, we have been we've been pleasantly surprised. I mean, we took the approach um, from the beginning of embracing the regulatory regime. Um, you know, FAA, EASA, obviously um, NASA plays a portion of this. The air traffic control kind of environment, etc. Um, there's a ton of different regulatory stuff down even at the community level. There's uh, ordinances, noise ordinances. There's zoning regulations, and we're just sort of um, you know taking in sort of Uber style. We're just you know focusing on the outcome that we're trying to achieve, and we're working closely with regulators um, to, make this, to make this a reality. Now, that isn't necessarily Uber's, you know, kind of history. Um, you know, a lot of people think we would just kind of like, you know, run in and just try to make it happen, and, you know, and, um, but we, what we found is two things. That are, you know, one thing we found and one thing we, is just true. One thing we found is that the regulators are embracing this, and I think it's the excitement of the vision that gets everyone rallied around it, and it's also the believability of ride sharing in the sky. It just seems like a super, you know, a reasonable business model, and I think everybody really believes that they'll be able to push a button and get a flight with this model. The other piece is that Uber's just grown up as a company. And we, you know, what we do today as a, as a you know, large company on the global stage, you know, we just have to be much more thoughtful and careful and, and, you know, uh, and our approach has to be different from when we were the kind of the scrappy startup. And so those two things have come together to sort of you know, inform our regulatory approach. That was Uber Chief Product Officer Jeff Holton. Well, fantasy sports giant DraftKings has announced it will live stream top-level European professional basketball this winter. DraftKings customers in the U.S. and Canada will be able to watch the matches on the company's mobile app. They can then enter a new set of statistical-based money contests centered around the league. Coming up, another food delivery startup is gearing up to take on Amazon Fresh and Instacart. Inside Postmates expansion into online grocery delivery next. And Congress continues to make the case for holding big tech more accountable. We'll discuss the latest efforts to hold internet companies legally liable for the content on their platforms. This is Bloomberg. Walmart's membership-only club, Sam's Club, and Chinese e-commerce company, JD.com, are teaming up to offer online to offline delivery of fresh produce and frozen products to consumers in China. The new service provides same-day delivery of more than 300 items, including imported meats, seafood, ice cream, and local delicacies. This service premiered in Beijing and Shanghai earlier this year. Walmart's partnership with JD.com has allowed Sam's Club to expand its reach to the majority of the nation, in part to JD's delivery and warehouse infrastructure. Well, Postmates is looking to bring customers groceries in 30 minutes or less. The U.S. startup has announced it will expand beyond food delivery and introduce a new service called Postmates Fresh, an online grocery shopping platform so far operating in a few U.S. cities. I sat down with Bastian Lehman, Postmates CEO, and asked about the company's newest venture. You know, we, we felt since so many companies want to be like Postmates, we can also borrow a name from another company that, that wants to be like us. All right, you're taking on Amazon. What makes you think you could do that? Well, first of all, um, we're, we're doing something very specific. We're delivering groceries to you extremely fast. A 30 minute uh, average delivery window. We have a highly curated um, selection of SKUs. So we're not trying to be Whole Foods. It's a lot more like a, like a Trader Joe's concept. And we believe that our customer base really, really wants access to high quality produce extremely fast. And what grocery stores are you partnering with? It's, it's a bunch of them all over the three cities that we're operating in. Urban Radish is, is one, for example, in LA. It's family owned. It's, it's, it's part of the community there, that's kind of the concept. What about Trader Joe's? Not with Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is a favorite. It's you got to get Trader Joe's. It's a favorite, but we like to control the operations here. So uh, we work with places that do the pick and pack for us, that handle the on-the-ground logistics so that we can just do the delivery component. Now, talk to me about the infrastructure. What makes you able to deliver food that quickly and at that price? Right. And is that sustainable? Yeah, we're making money on it. Um, it is sustainable. $3.99, it's, it's, it's a great price. 
Emily, there's 150,000 Postmates doing deliveries in 250 cities in the US. We've spent the last five, six years building out that infrastructure. Now it's running. It's very successful with prepared food, as you know, and that allows us to attack these new verticals and do it in a very price efficient way. There's a lot of food delivery companies that have come and gone since uh, we've been talking over the years. You know, where do you see this uh, space going? I mean, do you see like, just one or two leaders? Do you see, you know, th that there will always be a large number of competitors? Like, what separates the wheat from the chaff? So first of all, I think if you look at local commerce, $2.6 trillion market in the United States, mm -hmm. it's still highly underpenetrated. Only 3.4% of that is actually happening online. Food is 550 billion of that, 600 billion of that is groceries. So even with the competitors in this space, the market is still very nascent, it's very young, everybody is growing and can grab market share. So I think this will go on for a while. And you're expanding globally. We're Tell us about your plans. We're launching in Mexico next week. We're launching in, in Hawaii. It's not really globally, but... Uh, I'm from Hawaii, so Hawaii so is part of the United States. Honolulu. <laughs> we're super excited about it. But Mexico City is the first international city. We're launching there on the 15th next week. And from there on, we have our eyes on Canada. We look at more countries in South America. And we also believe that there are some Asian markets that are interested. Now, as a customer, you know, I, I understand you have cheaper options. You have subscription options. Options, but oftentimes when I go to Postmates and I get my, you know, order uh, rung up, it says that the delivery is $16. Right. You know, how do you get around that? Or is this just something that's going to cost more and the customers who want it are going to have to pay for it? So, two things. The first one is we have the lowest delivery fees in the market. $3.99, no service fee, no markup for 25,000 merchants. We used to have a delivery fee that's based by distance. Mm -hmm. That's gone as well. So even for out-of-network merchants, the highest delivery fee... For restaurants fee, too? That is right. The highest delivery fee that you will see is $5.99. It is never higher than $5.99. And what we actually did last month is we decreased our consumer prices by 32%. Right. Which brings me to the question, you've raised $300 million. Can you actually make... Can this be profitable at that price? Absolutely. We, we, as a company, we're profitable on a contribution margin basis. Half of the markets were operating in generate revenue and, and profit for the company, a milestone that we achieved two or three months ago. We're extremely excited about it. We have gross profit margins that we're very excited about, around 40% currently. That's up over 10 percent percentage points from last year. We're doing everything we can to create a business that's sustainable in the long run while growing extremely fast. And what kind of money are the Postmates taking home? It, it depends. They get compensated per delivery, as you know, and uh, there is a bracket that earns $25, there's a bracket that earns $18, and there's, there's people and, and, and couriers that can earn $30, $40 an hour. That was Postmates CEO Bastian Lehman. Coming up, big tech companies have long used a 20-year-old law to shield themselves from what their users post online. But could all that be changing soon? We'll discuss next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can now listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Apple already made a big splash in the original content race when it announced it was investing a billion dollars in video. Now it has outbid one of its chief rivals, Netflix, for a new show starring Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon. The as yet unnamed show will be the first recurring TV role for Aniston since Friends. It'll be set in the world of morning television. You can now add the two award-winning actresses to Apple's growing stable of content creators, one that already includes Steven Spielberg. Well, for years now, a crackdown on big tech has ran into a wall called the 1996 Communications Decency Act. It keeps internet companies from being held legally liable for the content their users post on their websites. But that may be about to change. Take a listen to Senator Dianne Feinstein just last week at the big tech hearings. You bear this responsibility. You've created these platforms, and now they are being misused. And you have to be the ones to do something about it. Bloomberg's Josh Burstein joined our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, to talk about this existential threat to big tech. 
think when you um, hear D uh, Senator Feinstein saying things like, you're responsible for this content, that's actually not been the case up until this point. And if we see some real action in that way, it could really change the economy of the internet. What, what likely change could happen? Well, the problem with, uh, from big tech's perspective, the problem with being responsible for content is they there's too much content for them to watch as it goes up. So it would really be a, a policing nightmare. The reason the senators are bringing this up, obviously, has to do with the questions about Russian interference. Well, there's no the question. Election. There was Russian interference in the yeah. election, right? At this point, there's no question about it. Um, it would seem to, so I would disagree with that, that statement and say that big companies can't afford it. Facebook mm -hmm. and Google, you know, Google has to monitor on YouTube which songs are being used and pay rights out to those song right owners. So on some level, they're managing this kind of thing. But what it might actually hurt are smaller companies who might actually lack the resources. Google and Facebook are not lacking in resources in any way. But bigger, smaller companies and startup companies uh, are. Right. That's always a tension in, um, in these tech policy questions where Google and Facebook are in a good position really to handle any increases in regulatory costs, but tech as a whole would be uh, in a much more complicated position. So we'll see exactly how this plays out. The sort of first battle in, um, in this has actually had nothing to do with the Russian interference. It's come via a sex trafficking law right. uh, where... Um, uh, advocates for sex trafficking victims want a law that would make it easier to go after platforms that enable sex trafficking. And, and there are some platforms that have, that have targeted these things, of course. Then we've got the whole issue of the dark web, where we've had everything from the dread private rob uh, pirate robbers to all sorts of uh, illegal activity of guns and, and, and human trafficking and, and, and drugs and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what ha what happened this week, or actually last week, was that um, the Internet Association, the trade group for uh, the big tech companies, dropped its opposition to this bill that would um, put more of an onus on tech platforms to um, to watch for sex Why? trafficking. Why oh, did just, they... just for the sex trafficking part of the business. Yeah, just for the, the sex yeah. trafficking part of it. They, they dropped their opposition. It, it's largely interpreted uh, as just the general atmosphere has turned uh, against tech, and they've really been fighting that bill hard and thought maybe this isn't the hill we want to die on. It, you know, it, as, as we think about what happened with the Russian, the fake news, uh, 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 where there were intent, where Russians, uh, uh, from what we understand, and, and their, their agents, um, uh, in creatively figured out the things that would really push buttons in the U.S. election and cause chaos and lead people to vote uh, uh, with their, their, their worst intentions and bring people to do that. The other thing that happened is people retweeted that stuff. And it initially might not have been seen by so many people, but the retweets, it would seem that the very least they could do is tell someone you were retreating fake news during the election or you were putting this thing out on Facebook so that maybe people would have the responsibility. But these, but it seems like the, the internet companies have been reluctant to talk about the ways that their services work to amplify uh, news and amplify uh, ideas. Yeah, absolutely. They don't want to they don't want to claim responsibility for what's going on in the platform. They would really like this to be seen as kind of a conversation that we are facilitating, have at it, and you know we'll provide the tools behind the scenes. Yeah, and, and, and again, it, it, the the efforts of you know it seems like the the information's come out, particularly for Facebook and dribs and drabs, where they said, you know, we we only a certain number of people saw these, and then the number got bigger, and we did, they wouldn't share the content for a long time, saying they couldn't, and then eventually they could. But it seems like they didn't really want to talk about how their service worked. I, I, and again, I think that people who retweeted retweeted this stuff or, or reposted this stuff bear some responsibility here. And I, I'm sure that Facebook could, if they know how many impressions were garnered, then they know who was doing this. Yeah. It, the one thing, as, as you say, it came out in dribs and drabs, you kind of have to wonder if they were going to have this conversation, maybe it would have been better to just put everything on the table at first, take your hit and have a conversation about it. Instead, we've had this conversation over and over with each consecutive uh, revelation. Bloomberg's Josh Brewstein with our editor at large, Corey Johnson there. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.